Hello, everyone. Joining me today is New South Wales Minister for Multiculturalism, Natalie Ward. Welcome to Indian League, Minister. Hi, Cohen. Thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful to see you again. Thank you. Minister, now you took over this portfolio on 27th of May, and in less than eight weeks after that, a large part of Sydney's multicultural-dominated LGAs were in lockdown. A baptism of fire? <laughs> Uh, an absolute privilege is what I would say. I took over a day after my birthday uh, and I was so excited that I could work with all of our multicultural communities in such an important way. Uh, and people really uh, understand in the government how critical our multicultural community is, uh, particularly in this pandemic, walking together in this journey so that we can get our messages out to all of the, our wonderful multicultural community across New South Wales so that we can partner to get things out in language uh, and through communities, through culturally appropriate messaging uh, and responses. So it's been, yes, a baptism of fire, but an absolute pleasure of one. And it's been a joy to work with everybody. I just want to thank the community for having me as the new Minister for Multiculturalism. I stand on the shoulders of those ministers before me, but it's an absolute privilege to get to know everyone in the, in the multicultural community. And I cannot wait until we can do that in person. So no training wheels. But what has been the highlight of the messaging getting across? I think looking at the numbers improving so much with the vaccination rates has been phenomenal. And, you know, I was very vocal uh, to my Cabinet colleagues and particularly to poor uh, Brad Hazard, who is still taking my phone calls, but probably not for much longer, uh, but really working closely with the community to get the messaging to health about how we had to nuance specifically for our multicultural communities that one size doesn't fit all uh, and that you know communities were responding so well i have to say one of the highlights was seeing uh, the amazing vax messages and the mission jab message was <laughs> so fun and to know that we could do this in a really fun way and to see how well indian link responded and what an incredible message i was been dancing around to it <laughs> children thought i was hilarious so i was great we get a video of you dancing around to mission jab yeah, I love it. Absolutely love it. Could we get a video from you of you dancing on Mission Jam? No, absolutely not. No. Come on, it's the messaging. We've got to make it happen. More people will feel incentivated. I'll think about it. I'll work on. I'll work on my dance routine. Um, but it's you know, it's been such a pleasure to work with communities like yours, and you know, to 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 acknowledge the importance, Poen, of the traditional media outlets because. We heard early on, we made sure that we prioritised getting funding out to multicultural media, but we heard really early that, you know, it was so critical to get messages out in language through those traditional formats. People want to read and listen to radio and understand, um, you know, the, print, the, the importance of print advertising and the importance of advertisements on radio. And to hear those um, going out was an absolute pleasure. And I, 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 was, I couldn't understand a lot of what was said, but I had COVID-19 and, uh, and so much of the messaging. It's just wonderful to know that we were partnering uh, with all of the multicultural media to do that. And, and the way that people have stepped up in their communities has been amazing to watch the leadership and the generosity of people to their communities, the messages I've had from people. Um, and for me, the absolute joy, you know, my husband says I'm very annoying because I always tell him what I think. Uh, and, uh, and he said, you never leave any room for doubt. You're always telling me. And that's what I did with the, with the government and with Brad Hazard to make sure that they understood that this was not a one size fit all and that we had to make sure we were wrapping around communities in the particular ways that they needed. Uh, and so that was an absolute highlight. It still is an ongoing highlight. And, you know, I was really very much looking forward to, to meeting people and having amazing festivals and um, celebrations. So I'm really, that's something that I just can't wait to get out there and meet. We, we, we'll do it after 18th of October. And I'm going to come back to that question in a while. Sure. In terms of uh, people are getting vaccinated, the rates are going up. But is there a danger of people getting complacent? Why is it important to continue the push for vaccinations? And what do, do what do what is what do we what do we do with the people who are the anti-vaxxers? That's an excellent question, and uh, we we've seen the rates of vaccination go up so well that they have been you know ahead of what we had potentially thought would would happen, and that gives us such great hope. The greatest danger, as you point out quite rightly, is that people get complacent. And they start thinking, oh, you know, I don't need to rush to get that second jab or I don't need to book in or I'll wait for this or wait for that. 
please don't wait, please don't get complacent because the numbers have been so good that we are looking like getting those restrictions eased as soon as possible. And I know you're going to come back to a date on that. But, you know, if we continue the trajectory, if we continue to get that first jab and as quickly as possible get that, get that second jab, and if we have those difficult conversations with the people that we love the most, those that are in our family, our communities, our religious communities, um, to make sure that we are all encouraging each other on that journey. You know, my friends will say, I have my second jab today, you know, and that people know that we encourage each other to get there and encourage each other to get tested. There's nothing wrong with thinking, you know, don't don't start thinking, oh, it's, you know, it's spring, I might just have a bit of a sniffle, it might not be. Go and get tested still. Make sure we're taking all of those steps because we've done so much hard work and I would hate to see us go backwards after everybody has stepped up so well to get us to the position that we are in now. Minister, should there be some restrictions for people who are not getting themselves vaccinated? We've been very clear on the pathway, Pala. We know that you know it's important that we set the boundaries going forward, set the rules for what will happen as we hit those numbers. Uh, and if people, unfortunately, don't want to get the, the, the vaccination, uh, then we have to put those restrictions in place to protect everybody in our communities. And we know that this Delta strain is highly contagious. It's quite different from what we encountered. And so many of our wonderful Indian community uh, have tragically experienced that. My heart goes out to all of those who know and have had loved ones pass away um, because of this dreadful um, particular strain of Delta. It's so contagious that we need to be really vigilant about it. And so to protect those that we love, to protect our communities and to emerge from this safely, we have to make sure that those requirements are in place so that majority of people can get out there again and can go about their business. People want to get back to work. They want mm -hmm. to get back to their businesses. Um, we have seen with the kids getting back to school. Uh, it's really important that we do that and we do it safely. So for the moment, the health advice is that's what's in place and we've been very clear about that from the beginning. Minister, you mentioned about uh, schools reopening. Now, there's concern amongst the parents about sitting, about children sitting in closed rooms without the best ventilation, etc. So, what is the New South Wales government doing for greater protection of the school community? Yeah, it's a, yeah, that's so true. And as a parent uh, of school-aged children, I absolutely understand those concerns. We want to look after our children as best we can. Uh, and we want that return to face-to-face -to -face learning to be as safe as possible. Uh, and so we've seen a number of key um, things that have been undertaken. I've spoken to Sarah Mitchell, the Education Minister personally, and she's held a number of forums, particularly specifically with schools and school leaders and school leadership and students themselves uh, to reassure them about the steps being taken. So those level three restrictions, those hygiene supplies, um, extra cleaning, uh, and the prioritisation, as, as we've seen, of vaccinations uh, for school-aged children, particularly HSC, mm -hmm. I have an HSC student uh, and he's had his jabs, which is great, but they're key um, measures that are being taken to ensure that they have safe classrooms. And schools are amazing. Schools are fantastic at putting these restrictions, they're not restrictions, but these you know um, boundaries in place mm -hmm. because they know their communities, the teachers know their students, and they can really safely control those learning spaces in terms of you, you raise the um, ventilation and that's been mm -hmm. absolutely critical. And um, uh, over the school holidays, the, the school asset management groups have been inspecting, uh, I think, something like 50,000 classrooms and all the spaces, any space larger than five square metres that is used as a, a learning space, they're bringing that, all those individual areas are being reviewed to ensure that they're being managed in accordance mm -hmm. with health advice so that they can be confident that when those students come back, that they are in the safest possible place that they can be. And so they're looking at uh, windows, fans, ventilation, um, air conditioning uh, and all those school levels, um, particularly to, particularly in terms of operate, operable windows and fans to ensure that they can get that fresh air to students. So, yeah, all of that is based on the health advice, but I have such faith in those communities who we saw do that last time. They really put in place excellent measures uh, and know their, their communities and we want to keep our children safe. Absolutely. Minister, now this is a federal issue but something which concerns Indian Australians and most migrant communities in Australia. We need your help in advocating this at a federal level and wherever you can. Uh, there are talks about international travel resuming, but it's expected to be within travel bubbles with countries which have high level of vaccinations like the US, UK, Singapore, etc. But for a highly populated country like India, to get up to 80% vaccination could take, double doses of vaccination could take some time. And that's a long time for families to be separated. 
what we would love to have in place is rather than having travel bubbles against 80% vaccinated countries to translate that to travel bubbles with 80% vaccinated people from whichever part of the world they are. Can you work with your multicultural communities as they minister on this emerging issue? Yeah. Change the definition or help change the definition of travel bubble from country to people to people and make sure that that's a message which gets across to the governments. Yeah, I will be a strong advocate for all of my multicultural communities, but I do understand this particular challenge uh, for people wanting to get back together with their families, you know, wanting to see, uh, get together again and go back to India. I absolutely understand. And for those to travel here, um, and I will be an advocate with my federal counterpart. It is a federal issue, as you rightly acknowledge, uh, and we're trying to work together to um, work out for particular communities what we can nuance. I will certainly take that message to Minister Hawke. Um, we've had one meeting of multicultural ministers across um, the country, uh, and I very much look forward to more of those, but I will take that to him because I understand the community is, you know, really is desperate to see their families again. Mm. They've been so good at um, compliance with all of these rules and waiting, and tragically some, you know, have missed out on very important milestones um, in life and with families, and I understand those challenges. So, yes, I'm absolutely happy to take that and um, and try and do everything we can to get families reunited again until we can get to those high levels, which we, we have here, uh, and um, see what we can do to try and get families and communities back together again. Minister, before I let you go, it's expected that we'll come out of the lockdown on 18th of October. What is being planned in the ward household for that day? <laughs> <clears throat> That's a wonderful question. <clears throat> if I can give a hint to my husband, I would love to go out for dinner at a <laughs> restaurant uh, and sit down with friends. I, don't, I would love it to be outside and to be able to get together with some friends. Um, and I don't mind if that's just a couple of friends. I really want to take my mum out because she's been at home um, on her own and she's been very observant and very good. But I would love to treat her and my family um, to, to a dinner out somewhere with some wonderful, maybe some wonderful Indian food somewhere nearby uh, and uh, very be treated to that wonderful experience of going out once again. I, I don't think I'll even remember how to order or what to do. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I very much look forward to it and uh, wh whatever date that is, whenever we can get everybody out and to see all those other families and communities out together as well. And it's a wonderful thing. Human beings need to be together. Um, that's what we're all about. We need to share in those experiences. Even sitting in a restaurant with complete strangers is mm. such a privilege. We know that now. And we know that's a fundamental need for us as humans to be together so i can't wait for that and then maybe pa and you and i can go and have a coffee or a bite to eat at some point in person that'll be great a nice masala chai oh yes oh my goodness <laughs> now you're talking <laughs> minister look uh, any other message for the indian australian community yes there is a very strong heartfelt thank you uh, to all of the community who i know has worked so very hard and has got that messaging out to all of the community, but has been so compliant and the um, vaccination rates in the Indian community has been phenomenal. So thank you for your forbearance. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for looking after each other and your community. And thank you for helping to get the messages out. Indian Link has been critical uh, in that. And I thank you for all your wonderful work. We've uh, spoken to each other many times, but I just wanted to acknowledge how and you've been such a strong advocate and working so hard and all of your community there. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us on Indian Link. Uh, that was New South Wales Minister for Multiculturalism, Natalie Watt. Thank you.